Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Rise Urban Nation, where we ignite the voices of Black and Pan-African leaders shaping the future. Today, we got a special guest, my girl. A shout out to my girl, Extina. You know, I, I, I don't know how come I haven't met Miss Santana, uh, you know, but now I know, I kind of know. We we kind of got the brief story. We'll, we'll get, we'll brief you in here shortly. Um, so... This young lady I have today is a master of aligning personal and professional paths for profound impact. I can't wait to hear about that. From overcoming corporate toxic toxicity, I, I can't even use my words this Monday, to empowering women to lead lives of purpose and alignment, Santana's journey is nothing short of revolutionary Santana. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing well. Happy Monday to you. I'm glad to be here. Happy Monday. As you said earlier, before we hit record, big Monday energy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So now I got, we got to dive in. I don't know. I, I, well, I kind of know now. I was wondering why I've never met this beautiful soul before since Extina has introduced me to some of the beautiful souls. And it's because you moved was it three years ago? Three from, years, yeah. So tell me that 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 story. How did you go from being in San Diego and now having Portugal as a home? Give me that story. Oh, goodness. Well, I've been kind of all over. I was born and raised in San Diego. I went to college in New York City, uh -huh. moved over to Europe for a little bit after college, and then back to the U.S. when we had Trump. So it was like a weird like time to come back to the U.S. And, you know, it was just not hitting how it used to hit. And so during the pandemic, I thought, OK, I already know there's a better way to live life. There's a place I can go where there's more balance, where there's more safety and security. So I applied mm -hmm. for a visa to Portugal and they gave it to me. They called me up into the big leagues and I flew over sight unseen, hadn't even seen the apartment, uh -huh. um, was just like, OK, I'm leaping. Let's go. So I've been here. Yeah. For three years now. Three years. How you how you like it? Because I mean, you, I, I know you left during that Trump era and it's probably more relaxed. I don't know if it's more relaxing or less relaxing. Is there is there no such thing as racism in Portugal? Like what's what's the difference between Portugal and U.S. in your opinion, in your humble opinion? I wish there was no racism in Portugal, but there are some key differences. I'll just name that in the space because there's a there's a really big black community of expats here in in Lisbon, particularly, mm -hmm. but throughout Portugal and I mean, Portugal is different from the U.S. in a number of ways. There's universal health care is one way. Um, it's like the fourth or fifth safest country in the world. Like there's not a lot really? of crime, really, that takes place in Portugal. Um, yeah, I mean, there have been exactly zero mass shootings since I've lived here. And there's been like 1,000 since I left the United States. She laughs to keep from crying, but... Um, in terms of like, what does it feel to be a black woman in space and time in Portugal? It's very different than the United States. So okay. it's not that there's not racism here. Of course there is, but the racism here is not tied to violence. So mm. if someone has racist thoughts about you, it's very unlikely, not that likely that that's then going to escalate into violence, which is not the case in the U S Nah. Um, and I think also in the U.S., racism is very covert. It's something that you right. can feel in your bones and in your body and in your spirit, but you can't touch. And nah. you can't name it either because somebody will clutch a pearl. Mm. Here, it's overt. So if it's going to happen, it's like it's in your face and you know yeah. it's happening in real time. So it's just um, it's just different. Like. Man. Walk around in big crowds here, feeling completely safe versus the U.S. I'm like, where are the exits? I don't <laughs> feel good here. <laughs> Man, that, you know, like, you know, I, and, and you know, to because uh, I've me and I've had this conversation with several different people on on the podcast, even because uh, I have another young lady who l lives out in um, Medine, uh, uh, Colombia, uh, somewhere in Colombia, and there's there's a big black community out there, and yeah. it's like the difference in the feeling out there. Um, even if we follow the news, we got Stevie Wonder who who moved back to Africa and and, and encouraging other people to move back to Africa. It's so different. Um, so it, it it's it's something when I hear it, I'm like, I was like, man, that sounds beautiful. Like like just 
just being able just to be where I don't have yeah. to carry like, okay, should I go down this street? Oh, there's, there's cops over there. Like, how should I respond? How are they perceiving me? What's going uh, like thinking in layers, right? Not yeah. to have that feeling. We just like, just to just be like, I don't know. That's beautiful. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm also wondering, I'm curious where in the U.S., I don't know if you follow, still follow U.S., uh, news and politics. I'm wondering what is it like over there as we're entering another election cycle over here, and what is what are you, what are you seeing over in your side of the world? Like, how is the world perceiving us as we go through another election cycle? Yeah, I mean that's a beautiful question. It's I I I'm gonna I'm gonna come to that, but I'm gonna start like at the macro. Right. I think when you move abroad, like your relationship to home changes. And so like <clears throat> it widens a little bit, like the identity as an American. And it starts to get kind of fuzzy too, I think. Like you notice what makes you American more when you're outside of the U.S. versus when you're inside of the U.S. And so out here I kind of like, oh, okay, I can feel the borders of my Americanness. And so then you see other people interaction interacting with what they perceive from the media, from the news to be Americanness. And there's a big kind of gap sometimes between what folks see on the news because, you know, a lot of times they see the worst of our worst is what yeah. rises to the news versus always the best of our best. And I think that's probably true in the U.S. as well. Like if any news trickles down to port from Portugal, I mean, maybe you guys have heard about the killer whales that are attacking boats, but... <laughs> in Portugal? Killer whales attacking boats? What y'all do to the whales? There was, there was a whale that got hit by a boat propeller. Uh, it was a killer whale. And the killer whale was like, nah, fam, I'm not going out like this. And like taught all the killer whales in its pod to start attacking boats for revenge. And then whenever they meet new pods of killer whales, they teach those whales how to attack boats for revenge. So if any boats are like coming out of the Strait of Gibraltar and like going into the Atlantic Ocean, which is kind of like coming from Spain and passing Portugal, uh -huh. they're, they're getting attacked by killer whales. And a few That's of them crazy. have sunk. But it's like, it's these fantastical stories, I think, that end up bleeding from one, you know, country into another country's news. And so I think sometimes out here, unfortunately, uh -huh. you know, they see the worst of the worst, like, nah. versus the best of our best. So, I mean, yeah. it's not great. <laughs> the opinion well, is, it's not great. Well. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that with us because I'm 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 always curious to know because I, I had a conversation with a past guest where there's like you know, uh, and and it's because uh, he was African. And he was like in certain places of Africa, what we what we perceive of black people is, uh, in the U.S. is that when we, if we come in over there to stay away from these groups of people because of how it's portrayed, you know, yeah. uh, uh, like hood unsafe uneducated you know all this different stereotypes and, and they, yeah. they just for the life of them they can't figure out why right you know why is it like that right but they don't get to see our best and brightest as well too and the the things that really keep folks oppressed so long and they come here it's like i don't understand why they can't make it we can make it and it just becomes this this back and forth dialogue of the of lack of understanding awareness in the 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 bad education that's been educated through media through both lens of our stories. And so I yeah. always love, get, I'm always curious about what it looks like in other countries as uh, I have this conversation and dialogue. Um, but let's wrap that up. I want to talk about, cause you, you have an inspiring journey. I mean, just that alone moving from San Diego and then starting a career in life, but you also have an incredibly inspiring story. You transitioned from a high achieving corporate career to a life that truly resonates with your soul. Yeah. Can you share what sparked this significant change? Yeah. Beautiful question. I mean, I think growing up in San Diego, I grew up in, I grew up in East San Diego. So, you know, it could be a little rough. It was rough when I was growing up. Man. And 
the mentality for me was like, get out at like any cost. <laughs> like you will get out. <laughs> you will, you'll make it out. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know what that was going to look like, but for a lot of people, and I think a lot of millennials as well, like the, the dream that we're, we're told, like you can make it out or you can make it in general if you go to the college and, you know, get some degrees and go into debt and it's okay, just get that debt because then you're going to get a really good job and, and you'll pay your dues and you'll climb the ladder and, and then you'll arrive where I don't know. Um, and you'll be able to pay off the debt and all of these things. But as I was chasing that dream, yeah, I found success, what it felt like to me. I mean, I was, I was making more in a year than my parents paid for our house when I was a child, like growing mm. up on Fairmont Avenue. <laughs> Man. Things have changed now. The prices, the home prices has gone up, up, well, up. Well, I mean, that's true. That that's true. Too. So grain of, <laughs> grain of salt to the listeners. We're not talking about today's prices. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday's price is not Hard today's to price. Is, right. <laughs> uh, exactly. But I mean, for me, it was like being a, the like the first person in my family to graduate from college or grad school or to be making six figures as like a single adult woman. I was like, this is, whoo, I've made it. But it sucked. It sucked. I mean, for me, it was like I was burnt out constantly because the corporate culture is incredibly anti-woman and it's anti mm. it's anti-black, I would say. I think it's it's anti anything that isn't the mainstream. And by the mainstream, I'm I mean white, I think, and usually male. Um mm. So to, to be a fully embodied, articulate, <laughs> direct, confident woman that's brown and a leader in a corporate space mm -hmm. was just incompatible with my own well-being because the, the fight, the grind, this, this adage that we have to work three times as hard to get, you know, half as far – this is absolutely the case because it's not just that I was having to lead really complex projects or teams or things like that. It's navigating interpersonal dynamics where there's constantly an undertone of racism and mm. sexism. And for me, mm. I came out of my mother obsessed with justice. Mm. So if I see a spade... I'm not going to call it a diamond. Yeah, I'm going to call a spade a spade. I'm going to call a spade a spade. And, you know, I have one black parent and one white parent. So I also learned how my white mother navigated through space and time. And so I also learned how to mock clutch my pearls. And I also learned how to be like, I'm looking in the employee manual and it says you just committed an error, right? Like yeah. I learned how to protect myself in that way. But it was a constant fight. Mm -hmm a constant struggle. There was no like clock in clock out. It was constantly the swirl of like interpersonal dynamics to be navigating. And eventually I started a journey of wellness. Mm -hmm. I hit the Saturn return pretty damn hard in my late twenties, early thirties. And it was just like, okay, I'm going to start going to therapy. I'm going to start reading some books. I'm going to do meditation. I'm going to do all of these things. And as I started to heal myself from all of the stuff that I had gone through in childhood, what I realized is that me continuing to show up and fight a racist structure mm -hmm. to make them pick me and make them love me and see that that I, I'm, I'm good, right? Like, choose me. Yeah. This was a trauma response, wow. right? Yeah. And I just, I stopped. I was like, I, okay. So I'm just going to balls to the wall, unabashedly do me, and we'll see how long I can, I can ride this ride. And it was not long, dear listener. <laughs> it was not long. <laughs> And, you know, I had like a pretty like profound burnout and 
And, you know, the tech situation was blowing up, is still blowing up. And when my journey in tech came to an end, it was like a personal come to Jesus of like, Mm -hmm. this doesn't feel good. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this still? And and if this doesn't feel good, what feels good? Mm -hmm. And what does wellness look like, right? And so it was in that space of recovering from burnout that I started to ask myself those questions. Man, I think there's so many many things to unpack in that, and yeah. I, I'm I'm thinking about um, because I I was on a panel or I helped moderate a, a panel of women probably like two or three years ago, right after COVID, everybody's experienced burnout, and it was a panel of powerful women, and they were talking about their experience at being in corporate America, and this is what you're saying is the same thing that they were saying, and I I I, I as, as a male listening and mo- helping to moderate the conversation was realizing, you know, one, my privilege in the situation. And then two, how real it is for a woman to be a leader in a corporate and the male dominated space, because they get questioned at every single step of the way and they can never take their foot off the brake, even if they're right, even if they're in the right, because they will be questioned about their rightness and you know, the, the accuracy of their rightness. Right. And they have to be on point because if they, if they, if they're not, they could lose, they could, they could lose in so many different ways. Right. Um, And then there's another aspect of women, especially if you're raising families of what you lose as a, as a mother um, in the family dynamic household and, and those who, long for motherhood or want to have a relationship in the family dynamic, what they lose from that. So it's like, uh, it's like a lose, lose. It's a never winning situation. Right. And, and wanting to break free, but can't break free because of what's been ingrained, the stereotypes, the, the, what the level of success, the grind culture, all of that. And I don't know, like, how do you, how do you break away from the, how do you get out the matrix and, and, and realize when you're in misalignment <laughs> is the question. Like, so hard, uh, the therapy part, I can see how that can help you. But like, when, like, how do you really stop and question and get out of the matrix and start yeah. to understand what's, what does alignment look like? Well, I think we're transitioning in society right now. Like the Mm. pandemic changed a lot of things. We were going along status quo for a very long time. And the pandemic put a lot of things into perspective for a lot of people. And a lot of things changed. And what we started to see more clearly were all of these cracks in the system that we were just told to grind through. Mm. And so with all of that perspective shifting, I think I call these mirror moments. They're like these moments in time where you see yourself very clearly or you see a situation very clearly and then you can't unsee it. Mm, I love that. Right. And what we're seeing now is there's a lot of pushback and a lot of our Gen Z brothers and sisters are leading on this because they're like, yo, I'm not dying for this. I'm going to work my wage. Go off, fam. We love it. Please keep doing Man. it because the Shout millennials did not I, do that. I love, I love Gen Z for that. Like, because we have a work, we have a conversations living in the workplace where yeah. our managers, hiring managers like, all right, what are we going to do? Because I tried to give them more pay. I tried to do this and they just not having it. Like, I don't know what we're going to (laughs) do. I love Gen Z for this. I love them for that. I love them so much for that. But like what's going on, I think in, in society is we're seeing people get laid off. We're seeing wages are not keeping up with the cost of living. We're seeing there hasn't been a pension since 1992. Like Mm. it's just, you know, the trade-offs, that we were promised from going out into the workforce are not the rewards that we're reaping. And mm-hmm. instead, we see an epidemic of Black women unaliving themselves because of work stress. Mm. We see a glass cliff and a glass ceiling for women of color in the workplace. 
Mm-hmm. We see women of color and women writ large just simply not being able to win. There's not, there's, there's no winning. There's only losing, right? And right. so for me, it's not a question of how do we unplug from the matrix? It's an imperative that we unplug from the matrix. Mm. Because okay. this is life or death. Nah, literally. And it's either life or a quick death, or it's life or a very slow death. Mm. but that's it those those are the apples those are the potatoes like life or death so we have to unplug we have to reimagine and reprioritize where we sit in the center of our own venn diagrams of our lives we have to go Mm. back into the middle of that and say who am i what do i need to be well what gets me geeked Mm -hmm. what doesn't feel like work how much money do I need to survive and thrive, right? These are questions that we need to start ans- asking for ourselves and answering yeah. because it's just no longer the case that we get one job right out of high school and we have enough for a house, two-car garage, one car, 3.5 kids. We, that's just not That's just not how it works anymore. So yeah. what do we want to die for? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. What do we want to die for? Ah, I love that. That that if that does get you thinking, I don't know what will. Yeah. You know, I I I I love all that, right? And I'm thinking about you know, let, let's dive deep into the challenges of that real quick, because you know, transitioning careers is challenging enough, but aligning your life with what you want to die for, with your your personal truth. It, is yeah. another level, right? What are some of the major challenges you faced during this transition that people can expect to face when they're doing this work? Yeah, I think the number one thing you can expect to face is all kinds of pushback from your mind. Mm-hmm. Your mind wants you to be safe. <laughs> That's how the, the the human brain is wired. We have the that human brain is brain wired for it. survival, not thrival. Right. Boom. <laughs> Thriving is prefrontal cortex, cerebral, esoteric stuff, right? Like the the majority of your brain is like, how do we keep this organism alive? So when you start to move towards something that feels true for you, it's usually going to be a little bit unshaky, right? Oh, I dream of doing X, but I don't know anyone that's done X and has made enough money to, you know, live very well and pay all the bills and do all of these things. The brain is like, nope, nope, nope. We don't do that. And it's not going to say that to you. It's going to say it to you in terms of limiting beliefs. So things are going to come up. They're going to be like, that's not possible. Or that's crazy. Or no one's ever done that before. Or I'm not worthy. Or I'm not capable. Or I'm not enough. Or I'm not this. Blah, 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 blah. This is how the brain will say, stay in your lane. Mm. Right? So that's like without a doubt, something that you can expect to happen, you should expect to happen. And it's not about throwing in the towel when the brain is doing its job. It is doing its job to keep you safe. But things that kept you safe when you were a child, which is where most of these beliefs come from, or these mindsets come from, they are not the things that will necessarily keep you safe today. Like if your brain says, don't jump off a bridge, solid advice. If your brain says you don't deserve to be well, ay, ay, ay. Mm. this is not solid advice. Yeah. This isn't solid advice, right? So it's not about what It's not about avoiding that discomfort from the brain. It's about learning the skills and the tools to be with the discomfort as you show your brain who's who's who, right? Right. Well, well, break break that down for me because I I, like I love what you're saying. And I think we all struggle with this from time to time. Right. Uh, What is like? Give me a strategy that you use to overcome these these hurdles. Uh, you know, because yeah, I I feel like it takes a little bit of you know mental resilience and self awareness. Yeah, yeah, it does, it does. And honestly, truly, the only thing it really needs is practice. That's mm. it. You don't have to be good at mental resilience resilience today. 
it is a consequence of practicing. Mm -hmm. So when these, and I I have a guidebook on my website um, that I send to people all the time. It's free to download. It's like 20 pages. It's like, how do you work with limiting beliefs? Mm -hmm. Um, There's lots of ways to do it. But one of the, I I walk through like a four step kind of framework of how you can kind of talk back to these energies as they arise in you. And it's like the first step is noticing. And that Mm. sounds easy, but it's actually deceptive because when our brain is doing its thing, we're not in the habit of questioning it. We kind of believe what we believe and we're just swimming through life and we're not really in the habit of questioning all the time what our brain says to us. So the first thing is to simply just notice So when you're trying to, when you say, ah, I think I actually, you know, I want to ask for a raise. Sometimes you're not leaving the career, right? You're just, you need something else in that career. Sometimes you are changing careers. Sometimes you're starting a business. So when you're like, oh, I think I want to do that. The first step is to notice what is that yucky feeling that comes up? You can say, where is that feeling in my body? You can say, what is the thought that I'm thinking? But it's simply just to notice. And you can stop there in the practice and practice there for as long as you need to until that becomes a habit. But the second step is to really start playing with that. So you can start asking fun questions like, ah, is that true? Yeah. (laughs) Do I know it's true beyond a shadow of a doubt? What if it's not true? Mm -hmm. What's it doing for me? What's it not doing for me? Right. How's that serving you in this moment? How's that serving me? Right. Another thing that I all recommend to people is like a SOS kind of a practice because when some of these energies come up, they are not fun. They're mm. not. They're not comfortable. They're not fun. I mean, if you are a person that's dealing with worthiness, that's dealing with um, capableness, limiting beliefs, like I'm not capable, I can't achieve that, I'm not good enough. Any of those. Those are deeply painful things to believe about yourself. And so as a sort of SOS practice to take the heat off of that fire Mm -hmm. is a practice called, what do I need to be well? What do I need to be well in this moment? This is a self-compassion based practice. It comes Mm -hmm. from the methodology of like, look, I recognize that I'm suffering. This feeling isn't good. Okay. And this, this not good feeling is called suffering. And when I suffer, I, I long to not suffer. I long to be well. So what do I need to be well? And you just get real quiet and you listen to what your brain and your body tells you and it'll do some funny things. Sometimes it might tell you something like you need a Snickers bar. You haven't eaten in nine hours. It might say that. <laughs> and it's easy. And then you go get a little snack and you're like, you're right. I was hangry. You're right. You're right. But it might also say, I need to feel safe. Uh I feel unsafe and I need to feel safe. So what do you do with that? The second step of that process is to offer that thing to yourself. And some call it a loving kindness meditation. But you can simply in your mind make a very sincere wish for yourself. Ah, may I feel safe. May I feel safe. May I feel safe. And there's a funny thing that when you're bringing this into your field of thinking, your brain starts to woo, relax a little bit around the heat of that limiting belief because it's, oh, we need safety. Oh, okay. Let's. As a meditative practice, offering that thing to yourself. There's a couple of ways. I go into a lot of detail about ways that you can work with the energies of limiting beliefs. Some people call them saboteurs is not another uh, another mm-hmm. language that I, I hear folks use. No, but I love this the, SOS idea, though. I love yeah. That. Yeah. Like, like I'm, I'm even thinking about how. You know, this that quick tip right there is going to be great for our listeners. And, and even for myself, I'm thinking about how I can use it and remember it. Like, a, <laughs> funny. Uh, uh, by the way, that Snickers thing, that was a, a, a very good pun right there. Because uh, when I, when you started going through S, I was like, okay, stop. Offer a Snickers. <laughs> you know, Snickers. 
cut Santana a check, please. <laughs> Thank you. No hey, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, real talk that like, it's just such a simple and easy technique that anybody can do. And I know there's more probably in your, your guidebook, but you know, I, I love that because often I, I, when when safety's not there, you go on these tangents and you spiral, and then the spiral is what causes us to um, get out of alignment in so many different ways. So many ways, uh, and and sometimes it may not even be true. It's just based on some a fear or or something that's been embedded in us. It might not even be our truth. It be it, it may be somebody else's truth that they, you know, decoded in us, and we've used that as a as a as a guide for our life because it was implanted in us. Yeah. Um, so I love that. I love that. Uh, so thank you for highlighting that strategies. I think that's going to be pivotal for a lot of people's success. Can you share like a, a couple or, you know, a impactful project that you've been involved with since, you know, you've made this shift that can kind of really highlight some of that work that you've done and, and, like bring our our viewers into a closer in-depth look? Yeah, sure. I mean, one thing that's coming to mind is um, the International Women's Day initiative um, that I brought into the world this year. Um, Yeah, I mean, for me, like when I started my own alignment journey, it started with me sitting down and asking myself, like, what do I value? What do I want to die for? Right. What impact do I want to have on the world and leave in the world? And like, how do I want to do business? Um, What does it mean to do business in my own image? Right. And for me, um, impact and reaching into communities that don't have access is something that has always been really important to me. And so even transitioning into like out of tech and into this really heart centered work of coaching for me, it was like, okay, I know there's only so much impact that I can have on my own, but what would it look like to call others in to sharing some of this burden to make sure that we can be reaching back out into community and and lifting all boats. And so in the Mm -hmm. International Women's Day initiative that I launched this year, which will be back for a second year next year, I brought together a group of coaches. I just, you know, got on my grind, started DMing people, reaching out to my network, everything, and corralled together almost 30 coaches that volunteered over 200 hours Mm. of free coaching for women. And, you know, threw that up on LinkedIn, got like 40 or 50 women, I want coaching, I want coaching. And then we worked with an organization to donate the rest of the hours called the Women's, uh, the Women's Foundation of the South, mm-hmm. um, which advocates, shout out to them and the incredible work that they're doing. They have over 90 grantees across the South, and their wow. mission is to um, raise the health, wealth, and status of women and girls of color in the South. And so we were able to work with them and to bring free coaching to their grantees. And their grantees are people that are running teeny tiny local nonprofits like Hearts and Minds Work serving the people. So they're, you know, really, really working hard and and really, really benefited from receiving this coaching. So in the end, we were able to donate over 200 hours to 98 women. So this is an example of like what it looks like when you're working in alignment with what's true for you, because no matter where I go on this earth, impact and justice and reaching into community, these are things that have always been a part of me. And so it doesn't matter you know, how long it takes me to earn tech money again, or if I'm going to start, you know, earning big, big money, whatever it's going to be, it's always in the back of my mind is like, how do I amplify the impact of this work? So that's an example. I love that. I love that example. I think I may have interviewed the the lady who started what you were talking about. I was trying to look real quick if I could find that past interview. Is it Christy? Oh, man. No, Christy, I think is head of programming or... 
Now, yeah, she starts and she's been highlighted as, you know, one of the women of the South. And and her, and I remember looking at her website and page and like all these incredible, beautiful black women leading the organization and providing yeah. all these resources. So like, uh, man, I, I wish I could remember her name right now. But there. Uh, so I was like, oh, man, this is this is a deja vu moment right now. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I love it. Small I world. love it. I know. Small world. All right. So. Let's talk about lessons and advice. What are some valuable lessons you've learned on this journey? And what advice would you give to our listeners who are contemplating a a similar shift towards a more fulfilling career? Yeah, I think the lesson, some of the lessons, I'll give a bad lesson, bad lesson. There are no bad lessons, but I'll give a a more challenging lesson and then a, a more a more positive um, lesson. I mean, one of the thing that I learned the hard way, which I don't want people to learn the hard way (laughs) is you can answer the phone when burnout is calling you, or you can choose not to answer the phone. Mm. But if you don't answer the phone, it will lay you out. It will lay you out. I mean, I didn't get off my couch for about three months. Like I couldn't move. My hair was falling out. I had heartburn, insomnia. Like it was bad. It was the least healthy I've ever been in my adult life. And it came as a result of doubling down over and over and over to rise and grind, to fight the man, to get the title, to get the bag, all of those things. Mm -hmm. to fight for justice within a system that's inherently structurally unjust. That (laughs) Mm -hmm. led to burnout. And so your body will start to give you feedback well before that happens. Please heed her. Listen Mm -hmm. to your body. The body is having the wisdom and telling you that something isn't right. Please listen, because otherwise, you know, you'll learn the way that I did and you'll get laid out. So If you can avoid that, I'd love that for you. And, you know, a beautiful lesson that I've learned through this journey is that every time I was afraid to make a move, it was just just a little hint that I was moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Right? As I said, like your brain's going to give you some feedback when you're moving closer to what's true for you. And so for me, it meant that I didn't go back into the corporate world after recovering from burnout because for me, that wasn't true for me anymore. For many people, it will stay true, right? There are many people that aspire to climbing the ladder, to getting to the top, to getting CEO, COO, to whatever it is, right? But you deserve to ask questions like, how do I do this and be well? Mm. How do I do this and be whole? Mm. So sometimes you're not doing different work. Sometimes you're just doing work differently. But as you start to ask those questions, some fear might come up. And this is a natural consequence of moving closer to the truth. So every time I've pushed a little to see what's on the other side of the fear, I've been rewarded. Yeah. yeah. You know, fear, fear is a funny thing when you push through it there's so much that you gain on the other side and people just don't realize how much they gain on the other side. Um, But it's so hard just getting past it. And I'm also thinking, you know, the advice you gave, uh, like, it's so true. Like, you know, in your healing journey of whatever that looks like for everybody, I, I don't want people just to take away with the fact that your body is telling you something, listen to it. Sometimes your body may not be telling you something because and here's why I say this, because I had a conversation with some health professionals, um, you know, that I wish we could have recorded and put online. And they talked about some research and data that shows when people go into retirement, the people who've had the most stressful jobs, especially people of color, if they were in roles of leadership, even if they were really healthy. Right. How their body starts to deteriorate and break down after they get out of those jobs just because all of the, the the stress and toxins and all that stuff that starts to release in their body because now their body doesn't have to be in fight mode and, and it can now release some of the that 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 stuff back into the body. And is how, you know, no matter how much they go see the doctors, there's no way to reverse it. And it's just their body just breaks down on them. 
Yeah. Um, so you could, wow. your body may not be telling you something or you may not be hearing it. And you could be in uh, the great health, eat well, all that stuff. Uh, and there's a price to pay for that later on, right? Yeah. That money and no type of exercise can bail you out from. And wow. so living healthy in the moment is so important. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that because I, I, I know you said, and, and yes, what you said is very important, but even if you're not receiving it, this it's still important. And that that's the reason why I wanted to really bring yeah. that home for those people listening. I love that you that you shared that because you, you you threw a little nuance in there that I want to tease out. You said it might not be sending you or you might not be noticing or you might not be listening or hearing it. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I, I, stress is a killer. It is. Stress is a killer. And I think it's a chronic killer of, of black people. Mm-hmm. And our, our bodies were just not designed to be in constant stress. So if there is a way that folks can start to ask a question that I know is radical, mm-hmm. what do I need to be well is a radical question It is in a system and a structure that was not designed for your wellness. It is a radical revolutionary question. So ask that question for the ancestors. Mm. You know, it, this reminds me of, uh, What's the what's this girl's name? Ah, man, that ministry. She said, uh, "Rest is restorative and revolutionary." It is. And when I heard that the, for the first time, I was like, "Man, I felt that in my soul." Um, because we're in such a grind culture, and rest is not prioritized, and just the resistance to, uh go against that culture and rest is revolutionary in itself. Right. So yeah. Rest and restore folks and, and, and ask these questions that Santana has given us to, to reset life. I mean, if COVID didn't teach you anything, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I heard that. (laughs) Oh man. I could talk to you for hours, but I don't do the Joe Rogan type podcast. So Let's wrap it up like this. Santana, one, thank you for coming on, sharing this, your amazing journey, your your your, your inspiring story, these tips. Everything was just amazing, spot on. Um, to our listeners, if you feel inspired by Santana's journey and want to learn a, bit, a little bit more about living the life of purpose and alignment, don't forget to subscribe. Share the episode. Join us next time on Rise Urban Nation because it's your time to rise. Um, to kick to head us out, tell us where people can connect with you, Santana, and anything that you got coming up that they can really connect with you on. Yeah. You can find me on the interwebs all over, wherever the interwebs are found. Um, I'm on Instagram at Flow Foundations, F-L-O Foundations. That's also my website, flowfoundations.com. And yeah, like I mentioned, I have the Transforming Limiting Beliefs uh, guidebook. It's for free, available for download on my website. I also have um, an alignment bank of journaling prompts to sort of lead folks through these questions to help spur some inspiration in the Mm -hmm. pursuit of alignment and purpose. So those are both available for free download on my website. Yeah, we we love free ninety nine. So it's free, free ninety nine to get you started. <laughs> if it's free, it's for me. But but make sure you have support it too. If you need help in the journey, don't you know? Don't just limit yourself to free. If you can if you can afford it, and and it, it's something that's calling you and you need it, um, make some time to really connect with her so she can support you in whatever way that you need support. Santana, again, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your incredible work that you're doing to Thank empower you. others. Uh, that's it for our show today, folks. Like I said, subscribe, stay tuned. And remember, it's your time to rise and take that wellness leap of faith and wellness journey. Send out that SOS signal to your body and let's get into that wellness together. Peace.